Hello and welcome to Democracy and Dictatorship, a show where we seek to explore elements which build or destroy forms of government and stories that are born out of these relations of power. On this episode, we're going to look at how art has challenged the establishment and what the response to paintings, graffiti, cartoons or art installations have been. We all know that art is one of the most influential and powerful forms of communication. For decades, different art forms have crossed cultural and linguistic boundaries. Art has acted both a tool and a trigger for social, political or religious protests. Artists who dared question the system through their works have always been suppressed or looked upon as a threat. Artists who in recent years have captured the public's imagination is Banksy. The true identity of this graffiti artist is still a mystery. But for years, Banksy has rebelled against oppression, political injustice. Mandy Clark, our correspondent in the UK, took a closer look at Banksy's phenomena from the place where it all began. He is possibly the most famous graffiti artist in the world, but few know a lot about the artist, known as Banksy. Remaining anonymous is part of his mystique. Banksy comes from the English port city of Bristol and has long been his canvas. It's where you'll see a lot of his art on display. Right, welcome to this tour. My name is Tina. There are even walking tours so visitors can see his works. Some people like his art, some people like his messages, some people just like the persona. Banksy is most famous for his street art. It is meant to be outside, for the world to see. Though he does have some of his work in museums, his messages are anti-establishment and often provocative. Like, like his political messages, I suppose, and his artwork. It's different, I guess, and it's, it's very interesting to see how, how, he, how he does his, his, um, his take on things. But not everyone's a fan of his guerrilla-style tactics. Some have called him a vandal and want him to be arrested. But if Banksy defaces your wall, it could be worth millions. In fact, Banksy inadvertently saved a Bristol youth club by painting mobile lovers on the side of its wall. The cash-strapped club sold the painting and was able to stay open. Many here say they know the true identity of Banksy, but no one is willing to unmask him. In fact, there have been rewards put out of £3,000 for just a photograph to gift to the press and no one ever sold a picture. I think it's based on um, another 16th century piece, death rowing in his merry boat. Perhaps one day he will step out of the shadows, but it's up to him. The city seems set on protecting its famous son. Mandy Clark, we on Bristol. So Banksy is known for politically themed and war critiquing art. But such forms of protest and questioning through art is age old. Artists have been attempting this for centuries. In many ways, it has boiled down to a question about one's freedom of expression. Societies need art and artistic expression as much as it needs a questioning populace. History has shown that from painters like Pablo Picasso to modern day artists like Ai Weiwei, they've all been persecuted for their bold statements against failed democracies or strong dictatorships. Here's our correspondent Giles Gibson with that story. Whether it's painting or literature, the arts and power go hand in hand as you travel through history. In ancient Greece, Socrates challenged the governing system in the city-state of Athens. He paid for it with his life, drinking poison after being sentenced to death. But his writing lives on. And painting and art are just as effective as words as a vehicle for political expression. Pablo Picasso's Guernica depicts the twisted aftermath of a German bombing attack during the Spanish Civil War. Originally commissioned for the 1937 World Fair, Picasso turned it into a searing indictment of fascism and all war. As well as being a weapon of expression, art can be used to break out from political control. Chinese artist Ai Weiwei has for years been a lonely anti-government voice in the People's Republic. He clashes repeatedly with the Chinese Communist Party, 
through his art and in the media. In 2010, he called China a society that sacrifices people's rights and happiness to make a profit. But while Ai's work has hit home in the West, real political freedom in China seems distant to most observers. However, in modern times, art can still inspire real change. In the wake of the Arab Spring, street art spread across Egypt. Controversial President Mohamed Morsi lost power after protests broke out on the streets and through graffiti on city walls. Throughout history, art has had a complex relationship with power. Authoritarian leaders harness its reach for their own gain. But censorship and control can inspire great art too. And just sometimes, a simple drawing or idea can topple a regime. Giles Gibson, we on. A simple work of art can topple regimes and question democracies. That's a very powerful thought, and we definitely want to explore it more. So stay with us, because after the break, we're going to be talking with two experts on this subject about the power art really wields in this world. Welcome back to the show. We've been looking at the role art plays in democracies and dictatorships. To explore that more, we have with us Rajiv Sethi, who's an artist, designer, and cultural activist. Also with us, Parul Dave Mukherjee, professor at the School of Arts and Aesthetics in Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Thank you for being here. Let me start by asking, how does art and its expression uh, play a role in uh, democracies and dictatorships, Parul? Since your question is very broad, I'll narrow it down to the context of India. And, um, and India, of course, uh, since independence, um, it was expected that artists are supposed to be on the side of the nation state. In fact, the state institutions endless artist support in the nation building, um, which is why they often imagine themselves as uh, artist citizen, citizens, which is that, I mean, on one hand, they have to be um, distinguished by the particular modernist style, because that is how the kind of ideology that modernism imposes on them. On the other hand, they also want to um, think about what role they can play in furthering democracy in a newly colonized, uh, post-colonized country like India. Uh, so, Indian artists have been very, very conscious politically and also because of the trajectory of the, their own cultural practices and the fact that a lot of these notions about arts, aesthetics, they have come to India under the ages of colonialism. Um, and at the very beginning of modernism in India, which perhaps can be, it is very contestable, it can be traced back to early 20th century, um, it was very important for artists to assert their difference from what modern European artists were doing, for example. And therefore, uh, one of the ways in which they could assert the difference was through um, uh, foregrounding their cultural specificity. And, and what the political aspect here comes more in terms of how much they support uh, nationalism, which perhaps could be seen as a kind of political stance. Even in spite of the shrinking space for art sometimes and cultures, will people still make their way and try and fight that shrinking space and represent their art in oh, different forms? People have done that from, from history, so I'm I'm not even quite sure about the modernist tag, because I think they've always been modern. It's all relative. They've always responded to a certain situation, both individually and collectively. So there is a modernist in every age, and people have responded to what they didn't like, and they found creative ways of responding. And to me, that too is a, you know, is a, uh, there's always going to be the triumph of the creative. How do you think arts becoming more political, more than even before? Or yeah, do you in think? fact, uh, to answer that question, we have to go back 
a bit in time. And uh, in terms of why the space of art is shrinking at the moment, um, of course, now a lot of artists are wary of hurting public sentiments uh, more today than before. Um, but if you go back to uh, the time when Hussein, before he arrived at his controversial status, was very keen to uh, paint in a way in which he could capture his public's attention. And according to me, there are two kinds of artists. There are those artists who are kind of the romantic artists who work very well in isolation of the studios, and they work better outside the public eye. The other category of artist to which Hussein, I think, belongs, he's much more a public artist. He cannot work in isolation. It's very important for him to have a rapport with the larger public. And in his attempt to you know, strike this rapport, he perhaps people may think that he went too far. But his aim was not really to scandalize people, but to provoke people, so as to capture the attention. And he thought the best way one could do is by uh, drawing upon something which is common to all, a certain kind of civilization legacy, which is why he turned very much to you know, the epics, Ramayana, Mahabharata, which he, didn't, he did not perceive as just purely Hindu epics, but as something which everybody could relate to. Now, to me, I think when he was doing this, this issue never came up that he was a Muslim or that he was painting something that, uh, you know, uh, would later even become a controversy. It wasn't, it was a, and, and of course the Ramayana has been interpreted in hundreds of ways by thousands of people over centuries. So he is one amongst many. So when we talk of shrinking of public space, uh, you know, uh, this is a, uh, a phenomena that mm -hmm. is not ancient. It has had ups and downs in every age, but we've experienced it mm -hmm. in the last decade or two much more than uh, we remember or have records of. So would it then be fair to say that the political landscape as it changes and the societal landscape as it changes, it begins impacting art and then art will still go back mm -hmm. and kind of represent itself even stronger and find ways to represent itself even stronger. I have absolutely no doubt. And again, art mm -hmm. will change from just what we consider to be conventionally a painting or a graffiti on the street or something that has a, a very visual thing. It has, it has you know, the, the field of culture and the field of creativity is reflected in many related ways. And they, it becomes a movement. If we talk of deconstruction, it touched everything from poetry to dress, to thinking, to architecture. And I believe that, uh, uh, yes, uh, the creativity will triumph and hopefully it will connect and not get segmented into silos. There has to be, that connection is really what expands the creative space. Hold on to that thought. We're going to take a quick break now. There's more when we return.